Some scientists believe that a human bottleneck left a population of only a few thousand people to continue our species. They link this to a deadly super eruption about 75,000 years ago at Lake Toba on the Indonesian island of Sumatra. So where are these survivors of this global catastrophe? Geneticists can trace the movement of early humans by comparing DNA variations in different parts of the world. The area with the greatest genetic diversity is the most likely origin of communities with lesser DNA diversity. Professor Todd Disotel of New York University uses a deck of cards to explain. If I take a full deck of cards and I shuffle it and then I deal them out, there'll be hearts, there'll be clubs, there'll be spades, there'll be diamonds. Then if I only take a small group of cards, let's say they're all red, no matter how often I shuffle them, all of the hands that I deal will always be red. So the greatest diversity we'll ever find is always from the founding population, in this case, the full deck of cards. This isolates the most likely source of modern humanity to the area with the greatest genetic differences, East Africa. In fact, there's likely to be more diversity between the DNA of two neighbors in one village in East Africa than between a person of Southeast Asian descent and a person of Northern European descent. The diversity that we see basically around the planet seems to be traced back to East Africa. Many experts believe that our entire six billion population came from a cluster of only a few thousand people from East Africa about 60,000 years ago. But there's archaeological evidence of up to a million humans living across much of the globe tens of thousands of years earlier. Something seems to have happened to halt human development across most of the inhabited world in a prehistoric game of risk. The Toba super eruption 75,000 years ago caused a destructive global volcanic winter. A small band of East African survivors of this apocalyptic natural disaster may have sustained the entire human race. Professor Stanley Ambrose of the University of Illinois believes that the super eruption did trigger a genetic bottleneck. And he has a theory on how a small group of East African hunter-gatherers adapted their behavior to survive the harsh aftermath of the Toba volcano. Uh, I think Toba changed the course of human history by forcing people to become cooperators uh, as opposed to uh, selfish defenders of their small territories. Ambrose believes that a few thousand of our prehistoric ancestors survived the genetic bottleneck by learning to work together, building support networks and developing more advanced forms of communication. He bases his theory about the movement between Stone Age communities on the materials used to produce prehistoric tools in Kenya, and especially on a type of volcanic glass formed from lava called obsidian. things that made obsidian so valuable was that it was so sharp, uh, like broken glass, which is what it is, that you could actually shave yourself with it. Razor-sharp tools were precious possessions in Stone Age times. People would have gone to great lengths to find obsidian. It's possible to discover which volcano the obsidian originally came from. Archaeologists used this information to track movement across the prehistoric landscape. Ambrose discovered that the tool-making materials at sites from before the Toba eruption were almost all sourced locally. The stone came from inside the boundaries of the hunter-gatherer community that lived there, suggesting that there was little communication between groups. A volcanic winter triggered by the super eruption, when temperatures in Africa dropped by up to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, rainfall fell by up to 90 percent, and much of the vegetation died, seems to have changed this. At 
archaeological digs from after Toba, like this one near Ntuka, 60 miles west of Nairobi, most of the tools are made from obsidian, which Stone Age settlers had carried much greater distances from territories inhabited by other groups. Well, here's a piece of obsidian. It's likely to have come from about 70 miles away. When I find obsidian out here, it doesn't just mean to me a stone tool. It, it symbolizes relationships, uh, the, the ability to get across the territory. The movement of the obsidian suggests that in the bleak aftermath of the super eruption, people traveled long distances in search of scarce resources. But as Ambrose retraces the route of our Stone Age ancestors to the obsidian source at Crater Lake Quarry, he demonstrates that this is a tough area to cross. Driving around the African landscape is difficult enough. Doing it on foot with wild animals must have been a really incredible challenge for these people. An experiment at Kenya's Hell's Gate National Park shows how rigorous the 70-mile journey to the obsidian source would have been on foot. Daniel Shaw is a fit, healthy guide from a nearby Maasai village. The blood pressure is 100 over 60. He starts at dawn from a local landmark, Fisher's Tower, and attempts to walk as many miles as he can through this tough terrain before returning at sunset. Shaw covers a fraction of the 70 miles separating the Stone Age settlement and Crater Lake Quarry over the course of an exhausting 12-hour trek. He's walked 14.88 miles. It could have taken prehistoric humans days to get to the obsidian source, crossing the territories of other hunter-gatherer groups on the way. They would have to either avoid encounters with the people who lived in this area or have very good relationships with them. They probably preferred to have good relationships because I don't think uh, any rock is worth your life. Ambrose believes the tough East African terrain would have forced people to cooperate with their neighbors as they hunted high-grade tool-making materials from obsidian sources such as Crater Lake Quarry. I think this is a great place to come and collect obsidian if you're a Stone Age person because you can pick and choose the pieces you like very easily. So it's sort of like a supermarket where you can just come and pick what you'd like off the shelves. The sophisticated tools that were made from high quality obsidian would have helped the ancient Africans to survive in the barren post-Toba landscape. But Ambrose believes the communication skills people learned while collecting tool-making materials would prove to be more significant over the centuries that followed. The fact that people came from such long distances implies a new set of skills for negotiating, uh, traveling across people's territories. I think that was the last step in the development of language. He believes our ancestors' new skills developed in the tough climate after the Toba eruption changed the course of human evolution across the planet. Toba probably ultimately uh, allowed people to get out of Africa and populate the rest of the world. This was just the beginning of a revolution that uh, I think has continued. If the Toba theory is correct, then the six billion people alive today are descendants of a group of just a few thousand people from equatorial Africa who learned an entire set of new skills to survive the horrifying aftermath of this super eruption. So are there any lessons for us living in the 21st century? If the Toba supervolcano made our modern civilization, could it also destroy it?